go ahead and introduce our first speaker. I would like to give you a brief overview of today's agenda. Give me a second, I'm going to show you now. So this workshop will be divided into two parts. The first part will start with a 40 minute talk uh, by Professor Mauricio Morales about the overview of the conscious activities. And then we're gonna have a QA and a session for 10 minutes. And before we introduce our next professor, Host Jim Schlake about, who will talk about the preliminary structure concepts of Eugene Earthquake. We'll have a break for five minutes. And then we're gonna have another Q&A. For, for the Q&A session, you can always ask your questions uh, by writing them down in the chat box, or you can unmute yourself and go ahead and ask them. Uh, we encourage you to be engaged with our speakers because it's gonna be very beneficial uh, lectures to everyone. Um, and that's for part one. Uh, for part two, which will be hosted by Kilo Yeast, it will start with a three-minute talk about rapid damage assessment after earthquake using the ATC 20 procedure by Professor Meher Dad from Exponent Company. And then uh, that will be followed by a very fun activity planned for you guys to help you to understand more about the rapid damage assessments and to give you more of a hands-on experience. Um, ERI does uh, organize a lot of uh, post-earthquake recurrences traps all over the world. So uh, you could be potentially one of, uh, to be part of one of these teams. So we have invited Erica Fisher and Manny from ERI to talk to you about how you can uh, be involved in the post-earthquake reconnaissance effort by ERI. That's for the agenda for the workshop. I just want to let you know that the post, both parts of the workshop will be on the same Zoom link. So uh, you don't have to search for new ones or it's also, uh, it will be the same one that we are using now. So I'll go ahead and introduce to you our first speaker, Professor Mauricio Morales. Professor Mauricio is an architect and structural engineer with broad experience in architecture education, integrating structural design and building technology subjects. Shortly after he graduated as an architect, Professor Mauricio began his academic career as a lecturer in Chile. He completed his master's studies in seismic engineering, working as a structural engineer until 2010 and joining uh, Reconnaissance activities in two different earthquakes. Professor Mauricio finished his PhD at the left university. His dissertation deals with the use of damaged outriggers for energy deception of tall buildings subject to strain earthquakes. In 2014, he joined the Faculty of Architecture at Yasar University in the city of Izmir, Turkey. And since then, Professor Mauricio has encouraged the integration of seismic design principles into architecture design. His work has been conducted through design and workshop settings and published in journal and conferences on earthquake engineering. And now we are very happy to have him in this year workshop. Thanks again, Professor, for accepting the invitation and you can start whenever you're ready. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction and uh, for the invitation to join. I'm going to begin sharing my screen now. Um, I hope uh, it's fine. Let me just move this one here so I can be sure that everything is fine. You can hear me fine, right? And you can see yeah. my screen. Yes. Perfect. Um, so, yes, as, as, as it was introduced, I'm, I'm assistant professor in, in a faculty of architecture. So, um, I'm going to talk about, I would say, one of the first reconnaissance uh, reports that came out. It doesn't mean that was the, the better, it doesn't mean that it was precise, but it was, I, to my knowledge, the first one. It was quite quick. Um, I'm going to talk about that. And I'm also going to provide you with uh, what I consider a very personal experience of this earthquake. Um, and also, I hope I can, to at the end, I will address some issues that I consider particularly important, of importance um, in the integration between seismic design principles and, and architecture. Um, so, um, as you get, my guess is, as you know, um, the earthquake took uh, place uh, near a uh, Greek island called Samos. Um, 
in spite of that, the, most of the damage occurred 70 kilometers away from that place in Izmir, which is uh, the most populated city in the, in the nearby region, and particularly a place called Bayrakli, as you can read there, was affected um, in a severe way. Buildings in, in that area were affected in a very, very severe way uh, by this earthquake. So this is, a, as, as you can see, a, a Google map of Izmir and uh, the area uh, which was more affected. And you can see also some sort of configuration of the area, which is a bay. Now, I'm going to zoom in in the area of Bayrakli because I want to show you this. And, um, and this, again, Google map. Um, there are three red circles. And these three red circles that you can see here and here and here are um, the first three build buildings that I knew were collapsed during the earthquake. And that um, the yellow dot there is my house. I live in the same area and I was here when the earthquake struck. And I, since this uh, workshop is about reconnaissance, um, I, I want to start from that point. I've been in, in reconnaissance activities before when I was uh, back in my country. I'm from Chile and um, it's a country that is struck very often by earthquakes. So uh, I've been in those activities. Um, luckily, um, not, uh, not there when, when it happened. I mean, it happened and I was, I was in the area, but it was, I was not in the area that was most affected. I'm talking about back in Chile. However, here in Turkey, I was exactly in the area where, where these occur. So I want to start from, from that perspective. I, um, again, I live in the, in the area and this was this earthquake struck on October 30, uh, almost at 3 p.m. local time. And I was, like many people at that time, I was having a meeting from, uh, through internet, through online. And then I was just finished the meeting and then the earthquake came. And I, I want to show you some of, some of the first impression. So this area, Bayrakli, and I would say most of the, the buildings in Turkey uh, correspond to the typology you, you can see here to the left, in the image to the left, which is a multi-story uh, building. It's a residential building. Um, uh, and the structure is a reinforced concrete frame with a masonry, unreinforced masonry infill walls. And in a very, unfortunately, uh, I would say uh, typology, these uh, buildings have the ground floor for commercial areas. So this, this here, you can see a restaurant and you can see some, some stores there. This is a very typical image buildings, not only in Izmir, but also in, in big cities like Istanbul and, and Ankara. And this is the, the let's say, the, the typology of building that is predominant in the area of Bayrakli. And by the way, this, this is a building that, one of the buildings that collapses, uh, collapsed in the, in the, during the earthquake. And, and I want to show you this, this video. I think we don't need to hear the, the people, I don't know if you can, but you can see the images, I hope. Here, this is the same building you are seeing to the, to the left. This is a uh, footage from, from, yeah, from someone in, in, that took it and put it, posted in, in one of the social media accounts. And you can see here the, um, what happened. And the reason why I'm showing you this again is because I live very close to this building. And after the earthquake started, I decided to go downstairs. I live in the top story of a building very similar to the one that collapsed. And, um, and then the calls start coming in, people, uh, friends and colleagues who knew I was in the area. So they start calling because they heard there were some building collapse and I couldn't understand how how that happened. I've been in another earthquakes and I the, the earthquake, but I couldn't understand how, how that could happen. 
and this this building, the one you're looking at, is, is very close again to my house and it's close to a supermarket. So people start, start started to address me saying, look, look, you have to go and find the, the, the supermarket, you will find the, the building that collapsed. This is not my recording again. This is something I got from from the internet. So um, you want to go there, um, and and then uh, within less than two hours, uh, I went to the place, and this is this is within two hours after the earthquake, and this is my this is one of the pictures I took, and this is what I found. Probably you have seen many images with the rescue teams working there, people that made a fantastic job, by the way. And here you can see this image with with random people, people, neighbors, and people who who was around just just up in the in the in the building or what is left, and and trying to help. Um, and and this is one of the things that always struck me. Like we as, a, as a engineers, we we work with this, we design these buildings, and then we have to be the witness of this disaster. And and you can see, well, you can start noticing some um, structures and, and material deficiencies here immediately in, in, in this. And um, this is from, from the same day, as I said, two hours later, uh, around two hours later. And this is the next day uh, I went again to the place. And at that time, I had contact the people from, from Steer um, and, and, and we started the, the um, field work, uh, I started to collect pictures and I was trying to, to get as many pictures and many understanding of what was going on. Unfortunately, I don't speak Turkey, so my uh, I was very limited in that, in that regard, but this some some of these are, are pictures that I could could get. And just, just uh, for you to know, the reason why the people in this picture look quite still is because at that moment uh, they ask everyone to keep silent. Uh, why? Because then, then they can hear if there is anyone in the under the, the building. I mean, in the and this piece is there, so they can find if there is any any person alive. So they want everyone to be really really quiet. So um, that was my first, let's say, encounter with the earthquake and with this disaster. And as I said, um, there were other people also from Turkey who was able to go uh, into the areas and get some, some work done in the, in the field. There was a lot of people working directly from, from other countries. And this team was, was working in trying to deliver this report, this first preliminary virtual reconnaissance. Although they, some of us were in, in the field, uh, it couldn't be a... a, a direct reconnaissance report. So it has to it has to be virtual because of the coronavirus, of course. Um, so yeah, I my contribution, I have to say, my contribution to this report was quite, um, let's say, I would say um, secondary. It was, there were a lot of people who was working much more on this. Uh, I contribute, however, with some of the images that you're going to see. Um, my guess is you know this steer, but in case you don't know it, it's a, it's a group of, um, of universities that is trying to create resilience by uh, reconnaissance activities. Um, the main goal of this report was to try as much as we could to provide details of what happened. Uh, many of the things you're going to hear uh, in, in the next uh, minute at that time, this, this uh, report came out within two weeks after the, the earthquake. So many things were preliminary. There were a lot of hypotheses there that later with other people and other universities also doing their own reports and, and with a lot of engineers and, and understanding and, and studies, it came out clear what exactly happened. There are a lot of speculation also in this report because we didn't know exactly many things. Um, we were also trying to understand what are the local codes in building practices, because again, we couldn't understand why this building collapsed, what made them collapse. It was it something related with the code, it was a deficiency in the code, it was something related with the construction process, it was related with structural design, we didn't know. 
uh, understand, of course, what was the big grounds, big ground accelerations, and, and the, in, in short, what was the the effect of the earthquake. And of course, summarizing everything we could see uh, regarding damage to infrastructure. And so, what we know now about the earthquake, uh, as I said before, the, the epicenter of the earthquake was nearby a, an island called Samos here, which is a Greek island, although it's right next to, to the, the Turkish territory, as you see here. So, well, this, this island there, Kios, is also Greek, and then this island is Greek, and then the rest you see in the picture is, is Turkish. Of course, the earthquake doesn't discriminate between uh, nationalities, so it affects everywhere. Um, however, for some, uh, for us, uh, a little bit uh, strange reasons at the beginning, it created a, a large effect. The earthquake has a, had a large effect on the Izmir area. So the estimated peak ground acceleration was 0.4 G, 40% of G. And then there was uh, in the Mercalli scale, it, it reached between seven and eight, uh, mostly in, in, in Izmir again. Uh, here is um, the, the map that we could uh, retrieve from, from the AFAD, which is the Turkish Organization for Emergency um from the website and you can see here more or less the same distribution in terms of Mercalli's call uh, scale and the red lines here represent the the fault lines which are very very much numerous here so the first thing that came clear out of the the let's say the the, the first observations is uh, and when we could reach the ground accelerations, the big ground acceleration from several stations, recording stations, um, is that there were some stations that presented that incredibly large uh, big ground acceleration. So this one is located uh, around 20 kilometers from the epicenter. Um, and he had, he presented a acceleration of almost uh, one uh, G, as you can see here in the north-south direction. If you if you look at the, uh, the uh, left inside uh, upper corner, whereas the expected acceleration it's zero point four. Uh, for this for this zone according to the to the seismic hazard map so that that was a, a, a first let's say question mark what what it induced this uh, the increase in this ground acceleration um, so in order to, to to put this in perspective here you can see the uh, response spectra acceleration response spectra of these two, the two horizontal components of this motion. So in blue, you have the north-south direction. In red, you have the east-west direction. You can see that both of them overpass uh, both the design basis and the maximum considered earthquake uh, spectra for, uh, for that area, again, based on the, on the current Turkish code, seismic code. Um, so that was the first um, signal that, um, I mean, clearly that there were amplifications of the ground motion and the thesis around the, ing the engineer community very quickly uh, assumed that this was because of the soft soil, it's because of the soil conditions. Again, now we know that that hypothesis was true, but at the moment we, can't, we, we couldn't know. So it, it, it was uh, already knew by several engineers in, in Turkey, uh, and there were there were there are at that moment, and there were at that moment several studies addressing the same issue. And what was the issue? That the area of Bayrakli, I mean the, the overall area of the Izmir Bay, was uh, 
presented soft soil and Viracle in particular had this the, the worst let's say behavior in that regard and two um, the second hypothesis quite clear that came again very quick was that perhaps the building that collapsed were was due to these soft soil conditions and that came very quickly but quickly it went um, to um, let's say it was not considered by a simple observation and the observation is quite clear here in this picture you can see that um, uh, well in this terrible picture i have to say this is of course another uh, of the building that completely collapsed um, which is you can see the buildings at the back you can see that the buildings at the back present almost no damage so although we knew very quickly that this amplification of the ground motion created by the soil conditions could have effect by increasing the the the, the demand over the over the building so the building capacity in no way should have con should have uh, conducted the, the buildings towards the collapse and that is pretty much obvious looking at the buildings that are surrounding this one um and and then um we we look at what happened in in some of the the stations the the acceleration the ground acceleration we we recorded in, in some of the stations in Byracle. and here you can see if you look at um the uh, response spectra at the bottom you can see the the ones that are in this some sort of yellow color and the blue represented the soft soil conditions and then there is this dark green and dark blue which represents the uh, rock bed conditions and these four lines these four four plots at the bottom are for a specific biracle um, zone obviously when you have soft soil conditions the response spectra uh, increases is, is the demand uh, the spectral acceleration is higher as you can see here and that of course was pretty much expected so basically this is the real the reality of what we were able to experience in Byracle. however when you look at the codes you can see that all the the elastic design spectra was actually um, covering this possibility of large uh, accelerations. So if you go back in time, 1975, you can see this one here uh, is almost matching 2007 seismic code. And this is important because, why it was important? Because it was uh, the buildings, most of the buildings were, were built after the 80s, it would be buildings in the 90s um, in this area, and the buildings that collapsed, they, they were built in that of those times. So they were either, most of them were built under this 1975, or rather, I should say, they were supposed to be built using this code. So the first question is Does the code have a, a let's say, there was a, there was a, lack of definition there that might have led to these buildings to have a lack of seismic resistance. So the answer was no. And then even if you consider the new codes, the, the dark line here is for a uh, rock soil and then the orange is for the soft soil. Then if you look at both of them, then the, the um, spectra, the, the acceleration, demand the response demand should have been overpassed the capacity of the buildings so again if we look at more or less what happened or we look at the typology which is between eight nine and ten story buildings uh, basically what we're saying is that the accelerations the buildings experienced during the last earthquake were expected and were uh, somehow um, considered by any code, old or current, uh, in uh, in Turkey, of course, for the area. So here you can see a, a, a sample uh, graph.
ground acceleration in the, the Bayer-Eccle district. So you can see here the duration of the earthquake, which was around one minute. Um, so the, the conclusion here, the, the, the conclusion of this part of the report in, um, is that the seismic codes, the, 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 the seismic hazard read of the region was actually very much defined by any version in all the versions of the code. Now, if we if we if we have to understand, so then what happened? What the, the seismic code were, were covered in all this, this seismic hazard, and several buildings were were standing with almost no damage. So what happened? What what is the picture? What is the relationship? Um, so by the time the the report came to the, to light, which was again within two and three weeks after the earthquake. This was the 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 damage assessment um, around from from about ten thousand, more than ten thousand buildings that were were reviewed at that time. Uh, a large percent, ninety percent of the buildings presented no damage, as you can as you can see here. And um, one percent presented heavy, heavy damage, as as you can see in, in this one. Now again, uh, this, from the perspective of the engineer, is is a success, nevertheless, because when you have ninety percent of buildings with no damage, it means that the, the engineering is doing a good work. But the question was, what happened with that one percent, and what led to this incredibly, incredibly heavy damage? <laughs> Allah belasını versin bu adamı. Allah belasını ver. Ben ilgilenmem. Oh, some, someone is talking there. I can hear that. All right. So, um, so this is another picture um, which was taken from from I think from from the TV, uh, and it shows the same area by Rakle at the same moment after the earthquake, and you can see the dust coming from the buildings that collapsed. So you can see here probably in a more realistic way how they were distributed. So we wanted to know what happened. Um, so again, I'm going to show you another another image which show how this happened, this, this partial collapse of this corner of this building. most probably what uh, we thought is that um, as, 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 as you can see in the, in the video, the failure started by the, the columns. We, we assume that the, the, the failure started by the columns that are in the corner uh, because of the, the increase in the axial forces. And maybe this was created by the torsional effect of the that the earthquake created over the, the building. Um, let me see another one. So this is uh, another uh, case uh, which was very much documented uh, in uh, later reports because it became much much clear. Um, in which uh, you can see here this this picture. These are the the infamous now bearish bearish apartments. Uh, you can see here there are four uh, buildings, and the four of them had the same typology. The four of them were exactly the same, and uh, and then only one of them, which is this one, remained with almost no damage. Whereas the other three had um, almost the, the ground floor and the first floor completely collapsed. And you can see here that one of them is about to fall over. So this is a very good example of some things that were, were done wrong. Um, my guess is, is uh, Professor uh, Telik 
uh, in the in the next uh, presentation he will probably explain much more in detail about this, this situation so i will i will leave that to uh, him and his expertise and and i will and i will move on but what became clear uh, as as we move we were moving uh, and we were understanding uh, the situations and these particular situations is that probably the main problem um, was with the uh, design of the buildings in terms of uh, confinement, in terms of providing ductility. As far as I understand, there was a problem with the old seismic code in terms of providing ductility, which wasn't that much clear. And the the other one, the other, let's say, uh, observation that became really clear is that there was a severe lack of control in the quality of the construction in these buildings. So basically, these these buildings had no capacity, uh, um, uh, strength or, or building capacity, uh, seismic resistant capacity. But at the same time, there was a, a problem with the quality of the construction. Namely, the, the concrete was uh, not good enough, and it was not supervised. So um, that was probably the main cause for um, the collapse of the buildings. Now, um, what happened in Greece? In, in, in most of the damage that occurred in Greece was uh, reported in all the masonry and adobe houses um, in, the, in the areas of Samos and uh, Pythagorio, Carlo Vasi and Fati are let's say the main settlements in these small islands. So most of the damage was concentrated in these small houses. Again, uh, all houses made of masonry. We also observe some damage in hospitals, in infrastructure, public infrastructure. Not only in um, most most of them was was in Samos. Again, here you can see um, damage that was observed and in a hospital in Izmir, um, in government buildings, uh, we had a lot of non-structural damage. And again, you can see here some of the interior walls of the courthouse in, in Izmir. And there was a lot of damage also reported in, uh, in new buildings built during the last 10 years or 15 years where was reported a lot of non-structural damage so the non-structural damage was quite extensive although um, the the structural damage was was non-existent in this case some religious buildings were affected again this one is in in, in samos in the in the city of carlo Vasi. here the the, the church, the one part of the facade, as you can see here, well, you can see the, the original facade here to the to the picture of the to the left. And then you can see how it collapsed. Part of the some sort of uh, dome came came completely down. This is this was made of masonry, and there was some some damage to collections in, in museums. Most of them in. in Greece that also was was reported. Um, all settlements. This is in uh, Pythagoras and in, in Samos. Um, so there were some some walls collapse. In schools, and again this is in Samos. Some non-structural damage. Some infill walls that had presented some some damage there. And specifically, damage to, to infrastructure. Um, there were some, some reports about this one, but I have to say that this uh, highway was abandoned. It was, an, it was an old construction, it was a project to create a highway, and then uh, it was abandoned. It, it, now, that now, finally, they are removing it. They remove all these, these huge piles. But at the time of the earthquake, the girders were, were there, so they fall because 
of course, are used as a, a parking car parking place. So the the girl just came came down and over, like you see in the picture. So it was reported as an infrastructure damage in the in the report, but actually, uh, again, it was the the breach. What I'm trying to say is the breach was uh, not in use. And one of the things that that um, produced the earthquake and any earthquake with epicenter on on the sea is going to produce is a tsunami effect. So there was a small tsunami affecting uh, both Samos and the the city, or let's say the, the place called Seferisar here in, in Turkey. Um, at the beginning, there was this, this uh, let's say, that what they call the is inverse way that first it goes back, it recedes, and then later it, 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 it comes comes back. So, um, yeah, some, some jacks, some boats just, just got into to, onto the docks or very much into the land. Um, something that is, is worth uh, to notice, okay, so this is what I was saying. So there is a, this downward movement first and then it came, comes, comes back. So one thing that was, was quite clear um, from the videos, because there was a lot of videos in the, in the social media about this, these small tsunamis, is how um, unprepared was the people to understand the, the risk associated to the tsunamis. I mean, you can see the people there uh, really close to the wave were not moving when the, the wave is, is going away and when it's coming coming back. So one of the conclusions of the, of the report is that we need to do a lot of education um, to, to the to the community to the people about this these threats and of course uh, from the from the field of observations as I said one of the things that came real clear is the non-structural damage um, especially in the unreinforced masonry walls which are very common in, in buildings in Turkey uh, they don't use any type of separation here uh, so the uh, reinforced this unreinforced masonry wall, somehow participate in the resistant action and therefore they receive damage and quite much damage, one quite extended damage. So these are pictures that you can see the, the sheer failure of this some sort of uh, short columns, uh, these small walls here, you can see them very clear and you can see the same uh, cross failure over and over again, different buildings. Uh, plenty of diagonal cracks because of the the in-plane deformation of these infill walls everywhere uh, in cladding but also in interior walls here you have and this is um, something also that became quite clear um, two things one is the lack of transverse reinforcement um, and um, the, the rust and corrosion of these reinforcing bars everywhere, and the lack of maintenance, again, more non-structural damage. Again, these pictures were taken by Oscar, Professor Oscar Ostjelik um, from Dokuselu, which is a local university. And uh, these pictures are from the courthouse here in Izmir. Uh, here you can see some pictures of the deformation of the frames and some glass broken. Again, very usual when you don't separate the the flexible frames from the uh, from the structural frame. Some failure of, of plaster, which of course um, is not structural but can injure uh, anyone that is running underneath. Uh, again, some some cladding just falling off. And once more, a lot of uh, diagonal cracks uh, because of the infill walls that you can see buildings. And I would like you to pay some attention to this uh, column that is here uh, in, the, in the right side. And then here there is, a, there is a zoom in and you can see that there is uh, at least in the picture is not visible. There is no transverse uh, 
reinforcement. And uh, my guess is there is, but it's not as it should be. So the recommendations, I think I, I should be wrapping up. The recommendations are that um, the side amplification from uh, the result of the of the software conditions should be further explored and, and investigated for uh, for the potential uh, risk in future large earthquakes. Um, the infill walls played an important role both in the failure of the buildings, but also in the, the amount of non-structural damage. So it was also suggested that this should be investigated. Um, there was no earthquake early warning. So given the 70, around 70 kilometers away from the epicenter, we could have had 15 seconds early warning, which could have um, yeah, maybe saved some life or at least decrease the damage. So it was also suggested to implement this. As far as I understand, maybe maybe Professor Chelik then, then can, can complement this. I think there is an early warning system in, in Ankara or in Istanbul. I don't remember exactly which city, but definitely there is no none here in Izmir. Um, and of course, always it's suggested to use some, some supplemental um, damping system uh, the hospitals are required by law, as far as I understand, to use base isolation, but the hospital that you saw in the pictures uh, were out of that uh, after, they, they were built before that, that law came in, so they, they are not applied, but of course this is suggested. Um, and yeah, and, and based on, on the, the amount of damage, it could be proposed some, some feasible retrofit strategies. Now to, to uh, wrap up, I think still I have some minutes. I would like to very shortly address some issues related to what I think are some strategies towards the future um, related with the situation we experience here. Um, I've been in, in, some, in some other uh, reconnaissance Events. This one was in 2007. It was in, in in Chile, in the north of Chile, and what you see there in that that picture is is a, a former two-story house uh, which suffered of soft story. So the ground floor or the first floor uh, disappeared uh, in a very common um, collapse when you have when the building presents some soft soft story condition. So. Um, the, the earthquake in Izmir, although it was a terrible um, experience for the people who, who felt it here in Bayrakli and, and in Izmir, uh, if you compare it, for example, with, with a large earthquake uh, in 2010, which was 8.9 in, in Chile, uh, the acceleration, the ground acceleration, the big ground acceleration are quite small compared to that one. And then of course the duration of the earthquake is not comparable. And then you have a, a larger one as Japan. And then you can see again, the big ground accelerations with these two huge peaks. And then the, the, the time, the duration is, was, was almost six, uh, five minutes. So uh, again, the, the earthquake I'm talking about and the earthquake we experience here is not, cannot be classified as a large earthquake is rather a moderate earthquake. So it's not possible to, to experience such level of damage. Now, some, some things that need to be considered. Uh, the problem is the use of unreinforced uh, masonry uh, walls or uh, mostly here in, in Turkey, they use brick. And, and here you have the pictures that are very common in the landscape of big cities. These pictures are from Turkey. So one of the, the things that need to be done, apart from, from making considerations at the engineer level, which I am sure and, and I know that in the seismic code are included, uh, is we need to work with, with the people. We need to educate the people. We need to make, because this is not built by engineers, at least the one to the, to the right. There are, not, there are not engineers, there are no architects behind these constructions. It's regular people. So we need to somehow reach these people. Um, the other problem is the soft story, which is what I explained before. This is a Google image 
of a building that unfortunately collapsed. Um, and you can see here that, as it was, it was uh, hinted in the report, the role of the infill wall, although non-structural, uh, produces, uh, let's say, um, increases the stiffness and the strength capacity of the structure uh, in the upper floors, but it reduces it because there are no infill walls in the ground floor. And that creates what is called the soft story or weak story, depending on how you, you approach it. So at the end, the, the concentration of, of, of uh, lateral forces here, the, the concentration of stresses actually overpass the capacity of the columns and then the columns simply collapse and therefore the building falls over. And that, that is what we call soft story. And that's partially what happened here. Uh, now, as engineers, we can propose many solutions to this, this problem of the soft story, which is trying to increase the stiffness of the ground floor. However, you will be surprised, or maybe not, that this is a very persistent problem in Turkey. Here I'm showing you different earthquakes with different magnitudes. And in all of them, the soft story was present. It was a, it's an overwhelming um, damage that uh, mechanism that happened over and over again. So my, in my opinion, in order to find a solution to this problem is not just understanding the engineering problem, not even understanding the architectural problem. Again, in this case, is part of how the people use this building. So they need the ground floor for commercial activities. They have this typology over and over again. So in order to find a solution that is going to be comprehensive and, one, and is going to solve once for all the problem, we need to incorporate the users in this problem. And otherwise, I'm afraid to say, and I, I'm afraid I'm not going to be that far from the truth, in the next earthquake in Turkey, we are going to have, again, collapse of buildings by soft theory. Now, um, again, because my part of my, I mean, my background and part of my activities are related with architecture, and I know the audience if not all, mostly are, are engineers. I want to show you this building. And this building is in Japan. If I'm not wrong, it's in Sendai, which was very close to the epicenter of a 9.0, 9.1 uh, earthquake that struck Japan in 2011. And this building, uh, from the architectural perspective, you, you would be surprised that the, the, the design behind this building is related with that trees, with those trees that you see in front, maybe you can see it here, there is a tree. So the architect wanted to make a, some sort of interpretation of, the, of this tree or, or let's say the, the way the tree looks and create a facade, which of course is the structure, is the, is the supporting system of the base on these trees. And you, and you might tell me what, very interesting, but what's the point? What is how this is related? Well, in my, in my PhD research, as part of my research, I was using topology optimization. And if you take a, a topology optimized uh, design domain for, um, um, I forgot the name, a triangulated shape distribution of lateral forces, which is the static representation of, of earthquake forces, if you take this, and then you, you distribute the material according to that forces, you come up with optimizations or distribution of the material that are very close to those, those patterns I'm showing to the, to the right. So basically, when you combine these two, you get not only something that is related with architecture in the sense that is creating a new design or is based on aesthetical approaches, but also something that works from the seismic resistance perspective, from the perspective of the engineers. So this is a call for integrating architects and engineers in the solution. So in my perspective, finding solutions that works and finding solutions that uh, we can rely upon, not, not of course only from the engineering perspective, but also solutions that fit to the community, we require all these actors.
And to finalize, very shortly, I want to tell you a very short story about this, which was in the, in the earthquake in 2010. This was the only building that collapsed there. I'm not going to talk about that, but you might have seen this picture before, and um, you might have heard, and I'm sure if you Google this, this earthquake, you will very quickly will come up with this building that was the only building that collapsed in that earthquake. But I want to talk about this very shortly. This is a more than 100 years old house that was there in the area of the epicenter, near, near the epicenter of that earthquake. And that this house is one, one, one story house and is, was made out of these um, um, earth bricks. You know, this is it's called adobe, which is these this, uh, very big bricks or uh, blocks which are made basically out of earth. And you can see here how, how it, it, it broke down. So there is a lot of damage there. So um, the thing is, I was in the, this was part of my reconnaissance uh, activities. Uh, the people from the municipality, from the town hall, because this, this was a very small town, they came to me and said, uh, you know, there is this very old house, it's more than 100 years ago, and, and in terms of architecture, this house is called colonial style. It came from from the Spanish, uh, and then it was it was adapted to to let's say to the to the Chilean weather and so on and so forth. So it's very much important, let's say, from a historical perspective and from an architectural perspective. And of course, we wanted to keep it. We wanted to conserve this this construction. And and the owner wanted to demolish the house, so we, he was demolishing the house. So the people from the municipality, the people from the from the from the town hall, came to me and said, the architects came and said, can you go and talk to the owner and, and explain him that we need to save this house? And the owner is is that person that is there here in, in, in that image. He's giving orders to everyone. You can see you can see here the amount of damage again, uh, the diagonal cracks, very typical in masonry. And by the way, here you can see the thickness of the wall. That that. Uh, the, the opening, you can see a kind of um, window open there that is, is a cover, and this is one meter. We're talking about walls that have one meter thickness. They are really extremely thick. So I, I talked to the to this person and I said, uh, look, and I told the, the entire story, and and then I was trying to convince him, and he was like, no, we're going to demolish, we're going to demolish, and then I said look let me let me at least make the drawings let me measure the house before you demolish and then he he looked at me very very serious and to tell you the the other part what what he told me i need you to look at this image that is to the right this is a sort of map of part of chile of my country and um the circle here is the epicenter of this earthquake we are talking about. The 2010 earthquake is here. And the, the black star is where this house is. So you can see it's extremely close to the epicenter. Well, the house was because it's not there, no longer there. But you can see right next to it that there is another earthquake. There was another earthquake in 1939, which was a magnitude eight. And then in the upper part, you can see another earthquake, 1985. This was a few months before the Mexican earthquake in Mexico City. It was a few, few months earlier than that. And it was eighth, magnitude eight. And at the bottom, you can see the epicenter of the largest recorded earthquake, which was 9.5 in 1960. So the house, this house, we're talking, it, it was in the middle of all these earthquakes. So when I was trying to be pushy and I was trying to convince this man to not to demolish the house, he told me this. He told me, look, this house is more than 100 years old. And my family have always lived in this house. The house didn't kill anyone in, in the earthquake of 1939. Didn't kill anyone. Didn't kill anyone in the earthquake of 1960. He said, when I was a kid, when I was a kid, I was here in this house. They didn't kill anyone. Anyone, killed. my parents didn't kill anyone. In 1985, I was also in this house, and the house didn't kill anyone. And now, in this earthquake, it didn't kill anyone of my family. He said to me, "Didn't kill my my kids. Didn't kill anyone." 
So the house complete his its cycle, he said to me. The, the, the purpose of the house, it was built for not killing anyone. Now the house fulfilled its purpose, so now it deserves to die. And I couldn't say anything about that. And I said, well, you are right. I mean, the house deserves to die and in its own way, which is by being demolished because the, the house, ful it fulfills the approach. So what I'm trying to say is the house was designed to suffer with the earthquake, it was designed to have cracks, it was designed to, to, to see this level of damage. The only thing it wasn't designed was to kill people. And I think that is a completely different philosophy of what we use normally in engineering. And I'm not saying, I don't pretend to say we need to change the engineering perspective, but sometimes, sometimes we need to use, we need to listen to the people and the users uh, and, and look and look at the local traditions because sometimes we have lessons to learn from them. So that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any question, I'll be happy to listen. Thank you so much, Professor Mauricio, for the great lecture. Um, it's very good to have uh, someone with um, both architecture and structure perspective. Um, and it's good to know that you came uh, out of the earthquake safe since you live near to it. Uh, now we'll go for the questions. So if you have a question, please write them down in the chat box or you can go unmute yourself and ask them to Professor Mauricio. In case there are no questions or someone one would like to contact me later for any question, here is my email address. Okay, thank you so much for this. Uh, do we have any questions um, on the lecture? Okay, I have a one question. Um, since the city of Izmir uh, does yeah. live in a very active area of earthquakes, um, have there any changes to the building practices uh, that would help to prevent such damage in the future? I can see, uh, I, I saw what you, uh, the city have recommended, but have the government mm. taken it that seriously uh, to approve with these recommendations? To my knowledge, and I have to admit that my knowledge is quite limited in, in that regard because I'm not, I'm not involved in the practice. I'm, I'm, I'm involved in the university environment. So, um, yeah, again, in my perspective, it's a little bit far, but as far as I understand, the, the building practice, let's say, at the, at this, the code no, you, level. I'm sorry, Professor, for interrupting and, you, but this is very... Let's say the amount of enforcement or, or how this, even the separation of the infield walls, are already described and very much well defined. So uh, actually these codes as usual, they are, they were revised here. Say it again. Maybe if I stop sharing. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, yes, Hello. back now. Hello. Yes, the voice is a bit late, but we can hear you. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. So, 
what I was saying is that, uh, to my knowledge, um, the building construction practices are well defined by in the in the current Turkish uh, code. Um, so I don't. Again, this is a very personal perspective. I don't think it's a matter of revising the codes. Um, it's more about implementing them because there is a. I would say lack of lack of control. There, there is a there was a lot of building construction. I mean, those buildings were built by people who might have not known exactly, might have not have the necessarily knowledge to build this in the proper way. So I think it, in my perspective, again, is more about control, quality control, supervision, and following respecting these rules rather than than. Let's say put them in the code. I think they are in the code. But again, I want to say something really clear. I'm not involved in the practice, so I think um, I think I, I will I will like to hear what Professor Celik is going to say to 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 this to, for example, what is his opinion about this? <clears throat> okay, that's great. That's great. Um, uh, we have a question here. I just want to confirm that you can hear us, Professor Mauricio. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Okay, great. So we have a question here. Um, he wants to know, to know your opinion on retrofitting of existing buildings in the city of Izmir, especially retrofitting of soft uh, story building without possibly interfering with the upper floors using such as FRB or steel braces at the ground floor. Um, my opinion on that regard is that we should not, <clears throat> sorry, we should not intervene the, the ground floor because um, the existence of the ground floor in terms of program, in terms of function, is for commercial areas. And if you are the owner of that, or even if you are renting, the reason why you want this space is to promote or to sell something, right? So you want the, the larger exposition or exhibition area possible. So you don't want any brace, you don't want any wall. That is the reason why they open the ground floor. So rather than, than adding anything back to it, what we need to work with is with the upper parts. And in that regard, I think the best solution is to separate the infill walls from the frames. So then the, 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 the way the structure works will be at least homogeneous. Of course, then you need to reconsider if there is any retrofitting of the frame itself, maybe by, by adding, increasing the, the capacity of the columns. But I will not add anything to extra like braces or, or any, any element that is going to disturb the function of the, of the ground floor. Doing that is again, uh, going against the reason why we have soft story in the first place. So it's kind of neglecting the reality. It's like, oh, we have to put now braces, but people is exactly the reason why they, we have the, the soft story, the ground soft story in the first place. So to, to, to summarize, I think the solution is to separate the, the infill walls in the upper floors and not to touch the ground floor. Thanks, Professor, for the answer. I hope that answered your questions uh, by Ryan, and thank you for your question as well. Uh, do we have any more questions? I think that's it. Thanks again, Professor Mauricio Morales for your presentation and for accepting the invitation again. Um, and now we're gonna go for a five minute break before we welcome our next uh, speaker, Professor Ugshi Shola. So thank you very much for the invitation and, uh, and wish you success with the rest of the workshop. I'll, I'll stick around to see uh, Professor Shelley's presentation. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome, that's great, that's great. So we're going to start uh, after five minutes from now.
Okay, hold up, everyone is back now. Um, uh, okay. I'm going to sh share my screen, right? Um, That's great. So for the second for, uh, presentation, we're gonna have Professor Ushi Shalek, and he'll be talking about pre-learning instruction reconces. Um, before I hand the mic to you, Professor, I would like to introduce you to the audience. Uh, Professor Uz's research area focuses on structural engineering, earthquake engineering, and some specific issues of steel structures. He has numerous publications and real life project experiences on design of new buildings and bridges, earthquake reliability of structure, seismic retrofit of existing damaged or undamaged buildings and bridges. Professor Uz and his research team have developed, designed, fabricated, and tested metallic seismic energy deception devices at uh, Istanbul Technical University. His further studies are on seismic performance of tall buildings, implementation of advanced composite materials like uh, CFRB and GFRB, and the structure retrofit works. He's also a member of many national and international professional organizations and scientific committees. He has published more than 150 publications in national and international journals conference proceedings and research, uh, research reports and box. And now we're very happy to have him in our uh, post-earthquake reconnaissance workshop. Thanks again, Professor Luz, for that. Uh, you're accepting the invitation and you can start whenever uh, you're ready. Okay, thank you for having me uh, again. Uh, so I'm Oz Cem Çelik uh, from Istanbul Technical University Faculty of Architecture and uh, this is my website. If you would like to uh, know much about me, you could go to my website or if you have an Twitter account, I have a Twitter account as well. Today, uh, I would like to talk about uh, structural observations following the uh, 7.0 SAMOS uh, of the course of Kuşadası earthquake of October uh, 30th. Uh, 2020. So this is an image. We have two images uh, on the slide. So the left one is the collapsed, uh, very well known and kind of a landmark of this earthquake, uh, very well known apartment building collapse. And the right one is uh, from our university lab and we're testing actually here uh, reinforced concrete, non ductile reinforced concrete frames retrofitted with some metallic devices, okay? So, a uh, uh, very good opportunity to talk about the seismic damages to building, uh, as well as uh, uh, I would like to uh, talk about a little bit what we are doing in our labs, okay? So this is, uh, I would like to start with a uh, seismic uh, or, or risk of earthquakes in Europe. And you will see that here, uh, we have uh, a serious problem in Turkey when compared to other European countries, especially Southern part of the European countries like Italy, uh, Greece and some Balkan countries as well. Uh, Turkey has serious problems, especially in the North Anatolian fault line and we have a Eastern Anatolian fault line, uh, as you see here with uh, reddish or dark reddish colors. We expect higher uh, levels of uh, ground excavation in excess of 0.5 G or higher. In some cases we have, uh, we expect some 0.65 G or 0.7 G which is quite large to design a building in this area. So um, uh, this is, as an introduction, this is a, a list actually. Uh, what, what you see here is that in the last few decades, uh, I mean, uh, let's say three decades, the following earthquakes occurred in Turkey and the red ones that I had uh, made some reconnaissance investigation just after these earthquakes. Everything actually, uh, during my professional lifetime, everything started with the Azinjan earthquake. This is actually a city, uh, my hometown, and uh, uh, it is uh, 
uh, in the eastern part of Turkey. And in 1992, it was a earthquake measuring 6.8. Then started, uh, starting with this earthquake, we had Dinar, Jehan, and the, of course, everyone knows that 1999 Kojeli or Marmara earthquake measuring 7.4 magnitude. After three months, we had uh, Düzce earthquake in the same area, uh, measuring again 7.3 magnitude. And we have some other earthquakes in between 6 to 6.5 magnitudes. Then in 2011, we had, in the, again, in the eastern part of Turkey, we had one earthquake measuring again 7.2. So uh, after that, the, in the, these uh, eastern uh, earthquakes, then we had some problems in, in the western coastline of Turkey. For example, in 2017, Bodrum coast uh, earthquake with a magnitude of 6.6. .6. Actually, again, th that was the first earthquake that we shared this earthquake with the Greek part and the Turkish part. Then again, in the eastern part in uh, Turkey with Doğanyol Malatya and Çevrim Taş Sivrici Elazığ earthquake. And finally, this uh, agency earthquake. So uh, many, what, what happened to buildings actually during these earthquakes? We've seen that many buildings poorly engineered or non-engineered as Professor uh, Bertrand uh, told a lot about the structural systems quality in Turkey. And they, most of them experienced have seismic damage or some total collapse during the last three earthquakes, uh, last three decades earthquakes in Turkey. So uh, in this presentation lessons uh, from on-site investigations in the aftermath of above mentioned earthquakes with a special emphasis on 2020 earthquake uh, will be presented here, right? So the uh, seismic damage to mostly unreinforced concrete buildings, uh, 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 with uh, uh, some uh, unreinforced masonry buildings will be also some damages will be classified in, the, in such buildings. Also, I will be talking about a little bit on the structural irregularities, both in plan and elevation on observed behavior. And I will be discussing some features of them. Then uh, uh, before we go into the details, I mean, uh, in this presentation, I would like to give you uh, some information about the evolution of seismic cause in Turkey to understand the quality of buildings in, in this area. Everything actually started in 1939 with the great Erzincan earthquake. So uh, the magnitude was about uh, 8.0 or 7.9 uh, in 1939. And after the earthquake in 1940s, temporary regulations for institutional buildings uh, only modeled on an Italian seismic provision. So after that, we had uh, nine years later, nine, in 1949, temporary regulations were reissued with the, with the uh, say, uh, first seismic zone map and two zones were specified in that earthquake. As you see here, I mean, simply speaking about those coefficients, I'm not going into details here, because it's quite wide. And uh, I would say that quite low uh, seismic coefficients, 1% to 4% were chosen to design uh, buildings in those uh, years, actually. Okay. Then uh, in 1953, there were some minor changes. Uh, I mean, some detailing requirements for timber and mason structures were given. However, no rules for reinforced concrete uh, structures were specified in detail, especially for that retailing. In uh, that is a very big step back in 1962, after the establishment of the Ministry of Reconstruction and Resettlement in 1958, a regulation governing the seismic design of buildings was issued, and the, I would say the very first, very uh, first and in, uh, uh, very important specifications for structures to be built in disaster areas were, uh, was issued. And also, again, there are some formulas for site design base shear forces in this uh, earthquake as well, uh, earthquake called as well. And also there were some uh, additional uh, coefficients and also 
So it is also taken into account as a parameter here. And also, again, we have two zones, zone one and zone two, but that again, uh, the buildings were designed with rather low seismic coefficients in that year. Uh, then in uh, 1968, uh, so the regulation was again revised to include the third earthquake zone. And uh, this time the seismic coefficients were increased a little bit up to 6% in zone one, 4% in zone two, and 3% in uh, say zone three. Uh, this is, these are very well known, you know, values, alpha, beta, and gamma. These are some factors, the coefficients actually depending on the soil factor. Uh, and also the beta is the importance factor. We still use it, you know, uh, uh, today. And it is 1.5 for critical facilities and 1.0 for most other buildings. And also the dynamic coefficient factor depending on the period of the structural system. And uh, uh, there's a formula here. Uh, th that formula was actually adopted from the 1960s Uniform Building Code of the United States. Okay. And then, uh, uh, of course, 5% uh, eccentricity, existential eccentricity was taken into account in the uh, construction uh, structural uh, design as well. Then, uh, uh, fortunately, some additional rules for reinforced concrete. Uh, detailing were chosen, uh, were also given, especially for beam to column joints. I would say that first of all, ductile design behavior was taken into account in this uh, code. And in 1967, other positive earthquake uh, occurred and additional rules for reinforced concrete buildings, especially strict rules for, for reinforced concrete buildings with flat slab and one way or two way uh, joint systems were discussed very heavily. And then, uh, uh, this is a milestone actually, 1975, a new code was introduced to include many uh, new uh, des design requirements for the design and detailing on, of reinforced concrete members. And this code was based on strength design philosophy, not, not today's, not like today's code. And, uh, that's why uh, this code had to be used uh, together with the Turkish design standard for reinforced concrete structure, TS500, which was uh, actually based on a uh, German uh, DIN 1045 standard. Again, we had also some uh, documents, uh, some uh, coefficients here. In this case, uh, in this year, we have four uh, earthquake zones and K is very important here. Uh, representing a framing factor depending on uh, material detailing and also partition walls. Again, I is the building importance factor and S is the spectral coefficient. So uh, again, there are some other coefficients including the uh, soil uh, effects as well. And uh, people actually sometimes uh, uh, don't know, don't uh, really know about the drift calculations uh, that were, was actually uh, uh, proposed in the code. And in that year, I mean, in the 1975 year, the drift calculated under the design service earthquake laws could not exceed 0.25% uh, of the uh, story height for the reinforced concrete buildings. Again, note that here, reinforced concrete special emphasis was given in reinforced concrete buildings because in, in those years, I mean, in 60s, uh, 70s, uh, many, many buildings were made with reinforced concrete in this country. Uh, also, some additional limitations on cross-section dimensions of reinforced concrete elements and reinforcing uh, bars given. So uh, in 1998 and 2007, these, uh, I mean, uh, this is a completely new code. Uh, displacement based or drift based design actually was mandated in this code. Uh, peak ground acceleration definitions were actually be considered in this in, in this code. This is actually uh, again a very very strong code, very code, very co contemporary code at that time, and uh, it covered I mean many many issues of reinforced concrete design, masonry design, steel design, even. Uh, wood structural 
would design. Uh, so uh, the, the number of the zones were again four in this case, from one, two, three, and four. Uh, the other coefficients were quite similar. But this time uh, we had uh, four classes of soil studying with the firm Z1 representing here the firm soil and Z2 uh, again quite close to the firm soil, but Z3 and especially Z4 is a very weak soil properties given here. Uh, plus R is the structural behavior factor and varies between three and eight depending on the structural system material and details provided in the code. And uh, I, I would say that the code provides uh, very strict detailing rules. So uh, it's possible to compare the Turkish seismic codes for design seismic coefficients. I mean, very roughly, I mean, this is an, yeah, say you have a non-ductile reinforced concrete frame and you have a ductile reinforced concrete frame. If you would like to compare uh, 68 code, 75 code, and the 98 code uh, for several classes of soil, you will see that, okay, especially for the short period area, you have a lot of uh, very large differences in terms of safety and in terms of the magnitude of the base shear coefficient. So, uh, for, but, but with some, uh, for buildings having uh, some periods larger than one, Second, uh, the difference, especially between the 75 and the 98 code, uh, was not that much high. Uh, so, uh, the, okay, the, the current code, uh, this is actually effective since January 1st, uh, 2019. This is a, again a new completely restructured code with 17 chapters, including the newly added ones as follows, for example. Uh, lightweight structural uh, steel buildings, timber buildings, tall buildings, seismically isolated buildings, and also uh, we have a special section for simplified design procedures for regular buildings. So uh, again, we have an updated probabilistic seismic hazard maps for Turkey, and uh, you could actually, uh, there's no zonation here, you know, uh, it is depending on your geographical location, and you could actually uh, use an uh, interactive web app uh, via this uh, website, okay? Uh, and this is, I mean, the Tur uh, Turkey uh, seismic hazard map uh, for, a, for a design basis level. So the earthquake, uh, the AGNC earthquake uh, in 2000, 20 occurred around here and that earthquake actually uh, affected very large area and you see the affected areas were actually uh, considered as the high seismic regions. So what happened? I mean, this is again, after this uh, uh, very, very brief uh, information about the seismic cause in Turkey. So I would like to talk a little bit about observed structural damage to buildings in the last three decade earthquakes in order to uh, better explain you uh, the structural uh, building quality uh, in this area. So I will be focusing on, focusing on uh, Izmir area as well. So uh, these are really uh, observed damages, damage to buildings. Uh, the first one would be poor material properties, concrete and reinforcing parts. For example, uh, average, there's a study on the average concrete strength uh, in, Tur in Turkey, especially uh, buildings with some mid-rise, uh, low to mid-rise uh, build buildings, it's about 9.5 megapascal. It's not, it's about 10 megapascal. And the minimum standard uh, right now in the code is uh, 25 megapascal. So there's a very serious uh, reduction uh, in the material properties. Again, in reinforcing Bars we had uh, in the past, in older buildings, we used some uh, rebars. Uh, uh, they are not actually uh, high strength rebars. So they, they were plain rebars and they had some uh, problems regarding to their uh, bond issues, you, you, you know that. So the second one is uh, irregular structural systems in plan and elevation. Is, I would say a little bit related to architectural uh, issues uh, 
uh, as discussed before. So the pounding of buildings in series, this is a very serious problem, in, especially in the European side of Istanbul, for example, you know, if all buildings are uh, touching each other in, in this city. And the inappropriate reinforcement uh, arrangement in reinforced concrete members, non-ductile detailing, lack of confinement, for example, this is a serious problem in reinforced concrete members, uh, resulting in very heavy damage, damage or collapses actually in buildings, insufficient cross-section dimensions, short or captive columns, short beams, uh, insufficient lateral stiffness, uh, I mean, resulting in excessive P-delta effects, second order effects, I would say. As uh, also uh, Professor Beltran uh, pretty much uh, talked about soft or weak stories, uh, local, of course, local soil conditions, liquefaction, and again, as happened in the Izmir area, soil amplification. So among these, I mean, uh, in a collapsed building, you would see uh, all of them in that building or some of them in that building, but uh, we never saw that one reason actually resulted in the collapse in, in any building. So usually a combination of those uh, uh, problems uh, uh, happened in a building and then the building actually collapses during an earthquake. So uh, uh, among these issues, many non-ductile non reinforced concrete frame buildings without shear walls experienced heavy structural damage and collapsed during the past earthquakes in uh, Turkey. So now I'm going to give you some examples from the past earthquakes, then I will be coming to uh, specifically Izmir uh, area. So, but, but this is a very nice classification to me to see every detail, every uh, collapse detail in, uh, in sp uh, specific buildings. For example, the, 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 this first one is a, uh, co total collapse from insufficient lateral stiffness. I mean, we have only columns and beams, they are not pro properly connected to each other. Uh, then the whole building sways and never come back to its original position during the earthquake. And the second one is a, a total collapse from weak soil conditions. As you see here, I, I believe uh, one or two stories missing here, right? Although we have some very large, uh, say, shear walls here, I mean, the problem is soil here. Also, the, the, this is an example from a short or captive column. So you see the uh, uh, high stiffness uh, results in higher seismic or cyclic shear forces, and that force is not carried by this column member here. This is a, an example from a school building. So uh, this is uh, a nice example from a soft story from Ada Pazari area from the 1999 earthquake. And this is a, a, a building torsional, uh, having a torsional problem. So we have a, a staircase or elevator shaft in the corner of the building. So the other parts of the building uh, rotates about these, around these, uh, about these uh, corner. Uh, shaft, uh, so they, uh, they uh, their deformation, uh, I mean, the quality is not that much high, so they, they actually, they are uh, damaged, okay? So uh, these are some examples from uh, uh, Istanbul during the 1999 earthquake. This is a pancake type of collapse of a, uh, uh, of a framed building with non-ductile uh, details, and also some similar collapses from some other uh, earthquakes from Sultanda earthquake, a total collapse, and also, interestingly, a total collapse from a factory building. It's, it's an industrial building where we have almost uh, a complete quality of C40 or something like that in that area. Anyway, uh, uh, so also not only in uh, contemporary buildings, but also we had problems in uh, historic buildings. So you see a soft story problem in a timber building, the building owner removed the cladding of the uh, building in the ground level. So the whole building moved to the left and never came back to its original position during the earthquake. So uh, these are also the right hand side are uh, examples from the soft stories again in the uh, during the 1999 earthquake. 
And these are some bean to column connection failures in the Aldapazar earthquake. So you see a, a huge uh, classification and concrete damage here, and also buckling of free bars and also some yielding or uh, sort of, I mean, several uh, problems in the same area. These are some other beam to column connection uh, problems here. You see, we have no stir up here uh, through the height of the beam. And also we have a diagonal crack here, as you see. So in the second one, uh, this is a shear failure uh, quite near to the beam to column connection. And also we have some problems in the beam to column connections as well. Uh, so this is an interesting type of uh, construction here in Turkey, but it's now banned in, in the code, uh, fortunately banned in the code, but in, in the building uh, stock, we have uh, probably thousands of buildings or hundreds of buildings like that in Istanbul. So the, the, the upper columns, upper story columns are supported by uh, some cantilevers protruding from a corner uh, building. This is actually an architectural based problem. And after the earthquake, we have a diagonal shear crack here, which is ex quite expected here, right? So uh, also uh, we continue to see some uh, damage types uh, from uh, heavily damaged, severely damaged building. This is uh, about to, this is a building uh, that would actually be, that would uh, collapse during the earthquake, but uh, uh, had several uh, problems, several irregularities, and I would uh, attract or I would like to attract your attention to this compression failure in reinforced concrete column. As you see here, we have quite uh, seriously spaced, uh, quite amount of uh, longitudinal bars, but we have problems in the transverse bars here. Okay, I mean this is a little bit lack of confinement plus the concrete, it seems that the concrete dimension is not that much large to uh, accommodate the uh, forces uh, during the earthquake. So we have problems like uh, short beams, uh, short columns as shown here, and again, uh, short or captive columns here. And the right, in the right hand side here, so you see that building is uh, uh, in this area, I mean, that that part is uh, cap i mean behaves like a captive column uh, although the infill walls actually prevented that so that that was a very good example to see uh, some architectural based problems uh, would result in serious problems in the earthquake performance of a building right and then uh, uh, Let me close that one. Okay, so we have some structural failures due to soil liquefaction as, as well. Uh, there are some stories missing here. So we have some tilted buildings like here. You could even see the underneath of a building during the, uh, after the earthquake, so, okay. But again, these are not from the Izmir area. These are from the older uh, earthquakes happened in Turkey from starting from Erzincan to Izmir, right? So we have some, of course, uh, part, uh, partition wall damages, X cracks, out of plane failures of the columns, and also some gable uh, uh, out of plane of the walls, and also gable walls of the beams, top roof, be uh, roof uh, 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 in the roof of the structure. So it's just falling down during the earthquake. Okay, because of those uh, excavations. So this is a poor behavior. Uh, of the traditional buildings as shown here uh, with poor material, poor system, but also uh, performance of some traditional buildings were high for well-constructed buildings having good material properties, right? So th this is, a, th th there are two buildings here. You see the left one is, uh, there's nothing actually, it's quite safe to reuse after the building, af after the earthquake, uh, this is a uh, wooden, wood frame building with some infill brick, infill material also, although the second one had some open ground stories with some uh, irregularities and it's a, a masonry building and uh, had severe damage during the earthquake. So uh, also we had some mineral collapses 
uh, just after the earthquake. And similar damage actually, damage types were observed during the 2011 one earthquakes. I mean, from short columns to soft stories, weak stories or some insufficient, uh, uh, say, uh, wall crackings, insufficient uh, stiffnesses, etc. I mean, so, I mean, there's nothing new, uh, I, I would say. In every earthquake, we see the similar problems in the area. Maybe I should a little bit talk about that. Uh, usually, because uh, in most of uh, the cities in Turkey, people use flexible frames with weak infill walls. So they, they, their behavior is quite uh, weak and all partition walls contribute to the load canning mechanism. That's why the structure uh, experiences a lot of damage, right? Uh, and also a little bit uh, information about the other way building uh, with heavy roof. We have corner damage here. We have capacity loss of a masonry wall and also failure of this. The, the last one is the failure of the concrete column in the reinforced masonry. Okay. So these are similar uh, failure modes again here. These are new constructions under uh, in, in the area. So also we have uh, some problems. You see, uh, uh, quite near to the beam to column connection area. So the column has actually shifted outward. So also some seismic threat of the application. So we have uh, external uh, shear wall addition uh, as shown here. And also uh, retrofit of the tie beams with CFRP uh, sheets. This is also possible to do, to, to do some uh, fast uh, retrofit information. Okay, let's come back to uh, Izmir area. So the uh, uh, soil classification and expected amplification maps around Izmir, these are, uh, are all taken from this Izmir uh, municipality and this is open to the public. So you would actually go to that website and see what, what, what is expected in the area. We see that we have very poor concrete. That part is enlarged here, right? So uh, in this part, in this part, in this Gulf area, so we see all the red or reddish areas are quite uh, uh, prone to weak uh, soil properties. As you see, the soil properties are quite weak and we have very deep alluvial deposits in this area. So it, the, the soil is very soft here. And also, of course, the soil is soft and we have some soil problems. Uh, we, we expect soil amplification and the soil amplification is, and I, again, uh, this is the most damaged area in this area as shown here. So the amplification factor is in between 1.5 to 4, 4.5 or something like that, okay? Uh, so I'm not going to give you much details of the uh, uh, of the uh, response spectrum curves because Professor Batman has uh, talked uh, a lot about that. So th that was a uh, shallow earthquake and also uh, the magnitude was 7.0 normal faulting. Uh, the epicenter distance uh, to Izmir is about 70 to 80 kilometers and the peak ground accelerations, recorded accelerations were maximum uh, 0.18 G. And also, if you look at the new earthquake seismic hazard map, so we expect 0.45 G, around 0.45 G at Bayraklı area where those buildings actually collapsed. And uh, this information and uh, response uh, spectra uh, curves uh, are taken by the, our uh, ITU report, report. And Arjan Yüksel and Ahmet Güllü actually kindly provided this uh, information. And uh, then uh, I would like to uh, give you many uh, photographs right now, uh, starting with the, sorry. Sorry. Let me, okay. Uh, one more. So uh, we, we flew to uh, Izmir Airport and the airport which we checked the 
quality of the building, uh, if there is a problem in the, uh, in the building or not. So we saw that this is a prefabricated building, as you see. The whole building is actually a steel building, mostly steel reinforced concrete. It's a, it's a mixed building, but the uh, parking lot is a prefabricated building, which are very you know, vulnerable to seismic damage. Uh, so we, we observed no damage in this area. But when we go, uh, when we try to move to the city center, we saw some uh, 10, uh, some buildings up to uh, from, let's say, three to 18 story uh, buildings. And uh, we, uh, we understood that those, flex those buildings were made with uh, basically flexible frames uh, and constructed on a soft soil in that area. This is a typical uh, uh, photo, actually. They are not, they are uh, separated buildings, actually. They are not hitting each other, which is good. So usually people use the reinforced concrete uh, moment frames, uh, sometimes reinforced concrete moment frames with some slightly, uh, uh, slight, uh, slight amount of shear wall systems, not that much high. Buildings uh, also designed prior to 2000 and low concrete quality, productile detailing, basically weak foundations, soft stories, weak stories, highly stressed columns on the gravity loading and lateral drifts and shear critical elements we saw actually usually in these buildings, although we have not obtained any structural drawings of those buildings. So this is a building, that was the first building that we visited just after the uh, earthquake. So this is the uh, Zabe apartment at Bayraklı. This is the uh, figure actually from the before the earthquake and this is after the earthquake. So the whole building, so it's the eight to nine story building. So it's it actually uh, collapsed very badly during the earthquake. So uh, also we Architectural based damage was also widespread in the city. We, we saw that, for example, just to give you an example here, we have a column here and we have a cantilever here, but the column is not uh, connected by the, 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 the story beam. I mean, they are, they are free. Uh, unfortunately, the flexibility is high. I mean, the lateral stiffness is really reduced by these architectural details, right? So also we saw some post-disaster temporary shelters and damaging the surrounding buildings. And also we had some uh, observed some uh, architectural type partition walls or exterior wall uh, damages uh, like this. And uh, level one or two story levels were a little bit uh, uh, affected by the uh, by the earthquake, uh, largely. So uh, this is a, a again a, another again a big problem in again in uh, is that Izmir as well. So reinforced concrete frames with open ground stories. Uh, this is quite widespread in the area and also uh, not uh, a very big problem, but uh, in some areas, I mean, we, we saw some uh, pounding of buildings in series. I mean, you see this is a structural joint between two buildings and during the earthquake, these two buildings uh, hitting each other and resulting in some additional uh, damage in the building. Okay. So uh, this is a reinforced concrete school building with no frame action again. So you, this, these dots are missing actually. There's no beam around here. This is an again, architectural based damage uh, problem. Uh, 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 high and open ground story. So that building uh, was cl ju closed just after the earthquake. And finally, uh, non-structural damage, maybe not that much structure, but non-structural damage was high. So again, uh, damage uh, distribution in this building. Uh, we saw that there's an insufficient lateral stiffness in this building. And also the building was a little bit heavy building, right? Uh, so this is a Yajol apartment. Uh, apartment. Uh, so uh, that building uh, quite similar to the buildings that you see uh, behind this building. Uh, the, uh, the 
uh, around these buildings, but th that building is has uh, unfortunately collapsed due to uh, probably very uh, big structural mistakes uh, done in the made in the uh, in the design or as well as in the construction of the building. Uh, I mean, using some apps like Google Maps and something like that, just after the earthquake, they help a lot. I mean, that this is just to give you an example where you are and you take the photos and you, you could actually share online uh, or you can upload, you can download whatever you need with your team. This is, this is quite convenient. I mean, these apps uh, helped a lot uh, during, after, uh, during this reconnaissance investigation also. It was interesting to see that the agency earthquake uh, warning uh, also uh, appeared on the screen of the cell phone. So that, that, that was a very good uh, move actually by, uh, done by the Google Maps, right? So uh, again, from this uh, building, so I would like to attract your attention to beam to column uh, joint area. You see there are some rebars and that angle, I mean, that, that, that should be, actually uh, zero. As you see, there's a very large angle uh, and also there's a debonding actually here in the uh, bottom rebar of the beam to column connection. So there's a bond problem here. Probably that building uh, was uh, constructed with some plain rebars and they are not, uh, I mean, uh, say connected to the beam to column connection area with some sufficient sufficient development length, okay? So uh, that was a very interesting building. And there are also some videos, if you check uh, online YouTube, you, you, you will see that there are some videos uh, showing the collapse of this building as well, that, that apartment. Also uh, around the, that building, limited damage to a residential building as well. So uh, Ahmed, how many minutes do I have? I'm um. wrapping up. Two, three minutes, five minutes? Yeah, it's okay. Done? Yeah, it's okay. Five okay, minutes. five minutes. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up, don't worry. <laughs> so limit, limited damage to uh, a residential building, so slight damage. So this is a partial collapse in a residential building, uh, which is called as the Caragula apartment. So also Professor uh, Malche uh, showed this, then I skipped that one. And uh, okay, there are some several, uh, levels of damage like that. Uh, in some buildings, there's no uh, ground opening, which is fine. I, as you see in, in that part, there's not that much serious damage. And this is the airport, there's no damage. So the airport was a new structure actually. Uh, so it is made with steel and uh, uh, we saw no damage or something like that. This is actually uh, a little bit on the news on the local media with Professor Taimaz, uh, he's also joining us today. Uh, he's a professor of seismology from ITU. Uh, so people are really, were really wondering about what has really happened and what went wrong, wrong during, uh, during the earthquake. Uh, so you, you, what we see here that uh, we saw many residential, industrial and uh, uh, school buildings that have been seismically retrofitted uh, in Turkey after these damages. And these studies really uh, contributed to the Turkish construction practice, especially the design and retrofit of uh, buildings. Now I'm going to show you a few examples of those uh, retrofit schemes. This is an addition of reinforced concrete uh, shear wall to a uh, reinforced concrete frame building. This is column jacketing. There were some several reasons. This is an old code substandard building actually. So this is a steel building retrofit uh, in Istanbul. This is a that was a telecom building. We, we actually did the calculations uh, with uh, Dr. Sesigur. He's also joining us here. So with X, uh, steel X bracing components here. And these are uh, to retrofit beam to column connections with uh, externally mounted steel strip, strips. This is an industrial building that had some damage in, uh, during the 1999 Kojelo earthquake and be retrofitted by uh, steel bracing system as well. also some jacketing with uh, or confinement with steel elements. Uh, this is, an, for example, an old building, uh, 19th century 
mentioned building, this is a masonry building, and what we did here, we, we did nothing actually. We just provided a diaphragm effect on top of the building to increase the uh, diaphragm effect. So uh, finally, we observed, uh, we obtained better uh, stress distribution in the building. Just and that that building actually uh, also we I mean we shortcutted some walls to increase the shear capacity of uh, masonry walls. It's a good idea to shortcut them. So these are examples. This is an example from University of Scuba. Uh, uh, so placing a retrofit example. So we, you, you could actually uh, try to uh, implement these in your buildings if you have any problem in, in that area. So uh, this is an example from uh, Istanbul Technical University. So this is Energy Technic Park building. So we added uh, some uh, and metallic energy dissipation devices here. So this is actually believed uh, to be the implementation of buckling restraint basically This is the kind of uh, energy dissipator, you know, for the first time in Turkey. So that building uh, was constructed and uh, uh, yeah, this is the finished uh, situation. Uh, so this is a, a, a detail from the structural joint area, okay? And uh, there are some conclusions, but I had already uh, talked uh, about those. Uh, so, I, but, but the, the first thing, the very important thing, so I, I would say that numerous non-engineered reinforced concrete buildings having fundamental periods of 0.3 to 1 seconds or 1.2 seconds with unpredictable seismic performance still exist in the region, especially in Izmir, uh, we have some uh, buildings with some uh, 10 to 15 stories and their seismic performance is not that much protect, uh, predictable. Uh, so we should be focusing on to improve their uh, seismic uh, behavior uh, very carefully. And it seems that uh, it seems feasible to assume a life safety criterion for the fast, uh, in quotation, I mean, uh, seismic retrofit of most of these residential Buildings. Okay. okay, that's it for uh, today. Uh, thank you for your very kind attention. And the question is how about Istanbul? So the population is 15.5 million, and we expect a serious earthquake in the next uh, forthcoming years. Uh, so this is a very big, big question. Thank you for your uh, attention and invitation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ruiz, for the lecture. Um, You're welcome. So uh, it's time for the questions. So please, if you have any questions for Professor Ruiz, you can type them in the chat box or you can go ahead and ask them yourself. Um, so why people are thinking about the questions or writing them down, I have one. Um, I have seen some pictures, but I have not noticed any uh, buildings with base isolation. Uh, is that common practice in Turkey or um, is there any building that are based yeah. isolated in Turkey? Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that, that uh, so uh, I mean, uh, base, base isolation systems uh, nowadays, especially nowadays, uh, they are widely used in, uh, in hospitals uh, in Turkey, right? The, the Minister of Health actually issued a uh, uh, memorandums and it, they say that okay if you would like to design and construct a new hospital in the area in any uh, city of Turkey and uh, if the capacity is above a limited a limitation so you have to do a base isolation system in your building so uh, and also uh, for example the largest hospital as far as I know uh, is being uh, uh, constructed nowadays in Istanbul, so more than 2,000 uh, seismic isolators will be placed or already placed in the building. So that's a very nice uh, move actually to protect especially uh, buildings with higher importance factors. So that, that is a good step, but in residential buildings it is quite, uh, I mean it's quite behind the hospital buildings or school buildings. So usually uh, government buildings uh, are being uh, isolated nowadays, Anna. Yes. 
So we have a question okay. by Biram. Um, his question is, yes. there, are, there are also so many high-rise buildings in Esmir. Your buildings on soil, on soft soil are generally risky to design. Did you encounter any problem in tall buildings during the- No, uh, that, that's, that's a very good question actually uh, from Bayram. Uh, he's a very, very, very good specialist on asking questions of buildings with some advanced materials by the moment. So uh, the, the building, I mean, the, the first building that I showed you uh, was uh, about nine story building uh, that the building collapsed uh, during the earthquake. In meters, I mean, let's say 100 meters or in that area, there are uh, two very large high rise buildings about more than 40 story buildings. Uh, I call those buildings of Izmir. So they had no problem actually, but they have of course, very nice uh, foundation system. They have piles uh, passing through the old alluvial deposit. And they are, uh, I mean, their foundation system is very concrete uh, and safe. And also the soil is uh, a little bit improved. So but what I heard about the, those buildings uh, were uh, people say that, okay, uh, uh, there were some non-structural damages, which is quite normal. Okay, thanks Biram for your question. You're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, thanks for that as well, Professor Owens. Do we have any uh, other questions? Uh, Professor Timas, are you there? No? Well, maybe not. Yes, of course. I'm I'm listening all okay. the way. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Uh, Professor Timas is there. All right, so, so probably, uh, Afet, if you uh, uh, let me ask a question to Professor Timas because he's a very well-known uh, specialist in seismology and he, he studied that area as well. Would you like to tell anything about seismological well, issues? Well, there will be another area? talk, but I, I think you two did a Professor Beltran and yourself covered the engineering aspects. Yes. As far as the Earth sciences is concerned, the nature behaves chaotically, stochastically, so unpredictably. So there yes. are more to say so, but I uh, have a paper in Oxford in press. Uh, in soon you'll okay. see about the summer's earthquake, but uh, I prefer not to speak more right now, but it's all right, all right. seismology. So maybe some other time. Okay, thanks so much. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you very much for your contribution. You. It's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any more All right. questions for uh, Professor Rose? Okay. I think that's it for the questions. Thanks again, Professor, okay. for your lecture and for your time. Um, okay. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me again, uh, Ahmed. You're welcome. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, I just want to let you know that the second part of the workshop will start at 3 p.m. Pacific time, and it will be on the same Zoom link. Um, we're looking forward to okay. working you then as well. Okay, I will try to join, but uh, there's a big time difference between yeah. your side and our side, you know? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks again for uh, invitation. You're welcome. You're welcome, Professor. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, okay. Okay. for joining, and have a great Bye. Day. Bye. Bye. You too. You too. Bye-bye.